Um, but I'd now like to introduce um, Sophie Pavel. Um, Sophie is a writer and a science communicator, and she also works for the Viva Trust. Um, and she's an ambassador for the Wildlife Trust and sits on the RSPB uh, England Advisory Committee. Um, and um, Ed very kindly uh, gave me a quote which came from The Guardian, uh, apparently, about her and about her book. Um, she, she's clear, it is clear she's a top notch communicator, scientifically literate, with a knack for exposition that makes data delicious, dumb delightful, and daunting truths digestible. She's <laughs> <laughs> been a mouthful. Um, but I think with no further ado, I'll introduce or I'll, inter I'll let uh, pass you to Sophie. talking about a bat, that's very kind of you. Um, I will be speaking for around about 30, 35 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions and things. Um, but I try and like to encourage people while I'm speaking to ask questions or if I say something that doesn't make sense or anything like that, um, just fire away, make it more of a discussion as opposed to a monologue for me. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking in a whistle stop tour, really, about what climate change might mean for Britain's rarest bat. Now, has anyone actually heard of the grey lumpy bat before? A few of you, keen beans, very good. <laughs> um, so, it's actually very special to be doing this talk here in Sydney because East Devon has a disproportionate uh, percentage of the remaining grey lumpy bat populations um, compared to the rest of the country. And so, um, and it features quite heavily in the chapter that I wrote about it. And so I'll be, I think to give you a little bit of a flavour as to how I wrote about it in chapter four in the book, um, I'll be interspersing some slides, hopefully, in between some facts and things with um, some extracts from the book, so I hope that's okay. Uh, so here we go. Oh, uh, oh, that looks a bit narcissistic. <laughs> this, uh, just to give you a brief introduction, um, in addition to Chris's lovely note at the beginning, um, I am 27, I'm a science communicator, I've had quite a, an intense introduction into science communication and conservation and the charity sector ever since I graduated from university. Uh, I studied zoology at Bristol and then I did a master's in science communication. And really ever since I did that master's, science communication and the um, method of basically being a mouthpiece for science for the public, being a middleman between what's happening in research and then what the public needs to know has really snowballed over the last few years. So it's been a really exciting time to be in this sector, as it's, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, the environmental um, sector and, and those communities are having quite a busy time at the moment. Um, so I, I work for Beaver Trust, that's, that's been my first job really since graduating. Um, so we are um, helping put beavers back in uh, England and British Britain's rivers. Um, so that's a very uh, busy job, it's very exciting and quite turbulent, so it's been um, an exciting few years to say the least. So um, a bit about the book, um, I read Natural History when I was doing zoology and I slightly felt obliged to do so, but I'm not a very voracious reader, I read very slowly and I slightly felt that um, natural history writing and the sector was a little bit of an echo chamber and I was at the time just in my 20s and feeling confused about what, about what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I didn't know how to watch wildlife, I didn't know how to find a species, I'm not a naturalist and so I'm speaking to you very much as a non-expert um, but just as someone with an enthusiasm and a curiosity to find out a little bit more about the natural world and what's threatening it and how we can help it. And so I felt very motivated to perhaps write a book that um, appealed to audiences that were perhaps in the same position. So people in their 20s and 30s and maybe beyond who um, had a curiosity and a care for nature but not necessarily any expertise or any prior knowledge um, but then wanted to feel informed and sponge up some information about them to hopefully help their future. So the book is uh, 10 chapters and 10 low carbon trips I make across mainland Britain. Um, from Cornwall all the way up into the Orkneys to find um, 10 native endangered species that I knew nothing about before I started 
and I deliberately chose 10 species that were overlooked and perhaps forgotten about. Um, not the poster species like the puffin and the dolphin and the beaver now, but um, the species that go a little bit under the radar even in the science. And so um, it was a, a, a bit of a ride really, taking um, kayaks and cycling as much as I could, and hiking and electric cars and trying to interrogate how well set up the UK is for greener travel and low carbon options. Um, so I'm sure, perhaps if you've been to some talks, um, it's actually environment day for the festival, is it not? This is today. Um, so it's very apt to be talking a little bit about climate change and what that means for Britain's species. Um, we're in a bit, of a, a bit of a pickle at the moment when it comes to the climate. We're in a bit of a spectacular crossroads in terms of what to do. The UK is very much on the global stage in terms of its climate response. Um, and so I was feeling like I wanted like many people wanted to do something about it, but felt a bit at a loss as to what exactly that looked like. And so it was real motivating for me when I got the book commission to try and have that message um, coming throughout. So a sense of urgency, but um, hopefully not too gloomy. Um, so yeah, for me, uh, writing this book was um, climate action, and I hope that it's inspired a little bit um, among different audiences. So in terms of providing context to this fact and what we're going to be learning about. Um, it's not really a case with climate change in the UK now of we can reverse what's happened, it's more the faster we act, the less we'll lose. Um, you know, in the UK is one of the world's most nature depleted countries, one in seven species are at risk of extinction. But the amazing thing is, is that actually there's incredible work being done and we actually know what to do a lot of the time. It's just almost a case of whether we actually will be courageous enough to implement those changes so that lots of species like our own back can have um, a brighter future. So, here is that. This amazing photo. Oh, um, uh, so, the grey longy bat is um, one of the rarest mammals in Britain. And um, I must admit that I sometimes forget that bats are indeed mammals in terms of. Their genetic code is very similar to ours, and they have these incredibly long, amazing ears, which we'll learn a little bit about in a minute. Um, but there's only about a thousand individuals left in the UK, and um, they, they have a cousin called the brown longer bat, which you may well have heard of, it's a lot more common, a lot more widespread. But it was a grey longer bat that particularly fascinated me, not least because I relished the challenge of trying to make an animal that has been so demonised over centuries and um, is perceived as not very beautiful. Uh, try, try and make it as um, appealing as possible. Um, so, a bit of a wide one. I will read all this out, so don't worry if you can't read it. I'm sorry I keep looking at my notes. I'm just recovering from COVID, so my brain is very foggy at the moment. But I am negative. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, this uh, animal is pretty much as rare as you can get. Um, it was once common in the UK up until the last glaciation period kind of shoved them further south to warmer climates. And then when that ice melted around 5,000 years ago, they slowly started to try and recolonise back into British night skies. But unfortunately, so few ended up recolonising that the genetic makeup of those animals and the stability of those remaining populations um, is very limited. So overall the, the population is really quite vulnerable. Um, so they have all the usual paperwork of the rare species which I won't read down. Um, and they have an exclusive invertebrate diet, so they like moths and flies and beetles and things like that. And what I find really fascinating <coughs> is that the habitat of the grey longing bat is almost exclusively wildflower meadows. Um, so lots of bats can operate in relatively varied environments, but the grey longing bat particularly loves a good old-fashioned English wildflower meadow. Uh, they can go into field margins and their woodland and things like that, but they are built for the meadow, uh, which you'll find out a little bit later. So actually the main population of grey longing bats resides in the uh, Iberian Peninsula in Spain, which is where climates are a bit more favourable to it, and it's really a stronghold for them. So in Europe they're not rare at all and they're not listed as a species of concern. Um, but in the UK, because of that glaciation kind of boomerang effect that happened a few thousand years ago, um, they are really quite in trouble. 
The best time to see grey lumpy longhead bat we're coming to the end of it now actually so it's april to october so female grey lumpy bats give birth to one pup a year and then they spend the summer raising them going out to feed find food for them bringing it back to the roost um, and then they retreat to caves and mines and um, just use buildings and things like that for the winter when they uh, hibernate and what's really special about these animals is um, they can be quite long-lived for the mammals of their size. They can live up to even over 10 years, and they're pair-bonded, so they, they make for life. Um, and some amazing research, which I've ended the chapter with, actually, is um, coming out from Southampton to show that these bats can form lasting friendships and actively travel, make the effort to travel long distances to maintain not um, sexual relationships, but actually friendships within the roost, which I think is, is pretty special. So there's just so much we don't know about these animals because we've sort of ignored them for so long and had our own opinions about them and let the media influence us about what we think of them, but actually they're one of the most important animals we have here in our country. So this bat, why is it in trouble? Um, I'm going to do first reading for it, one-handed, we'll see how this goes. Um, so I mentioned that the um, when the ice melted 5,000 years ago, a few bats, let's say, a small group came back to Britain to recolonise and start to try and do life here again. Um, but their gene pool was very small, and so to try and... So if you've got a lecture behind you. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> you know, it will be a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, in terms of genetics, it can get quite confusing, but in this extract I try and figure out what a small gene pool for this bat really means. So here we go. Such immaculate rearrangement of genetic code in response to ecological need is more likely to arise in groups of animals that have a healthy gene pool. Now, on the whole, I cannot wrap my head around genetics. It presents a similar challenge as looking at algebra without crying. But all we need to know here is a fundamental distinction. A healthy gene pool simply means an assortment of different genes floating around an interbreeding population where having children with someone who isn't already in your family is usually the preferred choice. In contrast, an unhealthy gene pool is the opposite. Stunted growth, poor cognitive function, and reduced fertility are some of the red flags that fly in a population where your brother might be your lover and father another mother. <laughs> European, European royal families have somewhat perfected this over the years. <laughs> The point is that genetics shape our armour against change, from climatic shifts to habitat availability. The more genetic variability a species has on offer, the more likely useful genes will be chosen and inherited by future generations. The more genetic variation simply provides more space to play with, more room for advantageous combinations of mutations to arise in the genetic makeup. It's just a better world for all. This is Darwin's natural selection, in a nutshell. For many endangered species, however, it's not so easy anymore. These vital pools are shrinking, and it's looking like the gene bank of the British grey longhead bat may be nearing its overdraft. Can I just ask you something? Yes, of course. Yes, please do. They move around in a group. Yeah. And it's not just coming but a small group. How are they going to avoid inbreeding? It's a really good question. So the question is how can, when there's such a small number of available bats to mate with, mate with how can they avoid inbreeding? Well, actually, that, we'll get into that a little bit at the end. So there's a project by the Bat Conservation Trust which is trying to tackle that very problem. Yeah, so the gene flow is really important because obviously interbreeding populations, as we found out, can uh, be bad news for the longevity of, the, of an animal or a person. Um, so, so yeah, really good question, but hopefully let me know if, it, if you feel it's answered at the end. Uh, but please do ask any questions as, as we go. So, um, in terms of why this bat is in trouble, so we know that it lacks the genetic stamina to keep up with the pace of change. So if an animal has a small gene pool and the world is changing at an increasingly rapid pace around it, its ability to adapt and evolve in response to that change is limited. And alongside all of this, I said that the grey longhead bat is disproportionately associated with good old fashioned England, English wildfowl meadow. But the bad news is that we've lost 97% of them since the end of the Second World War. 
Our priorities at that time were digging for victory, feeding the country post-war, getting us back on our feet. We weren't thinking about bats, we weren't thinking about insects, we weren't thinking about disruptions to the food chain across our natural systems. And so we're kind of reaping the effects of that at the moment in terms of seeing the domino effect of what that did um, all those years ago, what that's doing now to um, nature in our countryside. So its habitat is shrinking, around here especially where a lot of the population is concentrated, um, it's actively farmed, field margins are being removed, there's lots of work going on, buffers and resilience in our countryside um, is being uh, compromised in, in many ways. And um, this is reflected in things like triple SI, so it's a fancy way of saying that something is really full of nature, so it's a site of special scientific interest, so it's really important for science, really important for conservationists and data collection. Um, and 25% of those in the southwest are farmed, and so that as well will affect bats like the grey monid. And as part of that is the pesticide problem. So um, last year there was a great big report published showing that 17,000 tonnes of pesticides are showered across the UK landscape every single year. And we'll find out a little bit as to why this is such bad news for this particular bat um, in a bit. And then, as I alluded to at the beginning, there's the PR problem. So bats have been persecuted and demonised for centuries, um, especially in the West, and this has been very um, apparent in the whole COVID pandemic and how the, the root of the virus was discussed and uh, sort of hypothesised and, and all of this. And so uh, that's, that's a big thing to do with bats. Bats features, really. Um, another thing, and this is my favourite, favourite, but I'm really fascinated by this because it's a very new exciting piece of research. So bats echolocate, um, they use sonar to communicate and get around in the night sky, and uh, we've monopolised that in many ways, we've been inspired by that uh, adaptation with our own communications and sonar and how we operate in, in uh, various different ways. Um, and there's lots of research, especially coming out of Southampton University at the moment, talking about electromagnetic radiation, so essentially light pollution. Um, and I'm sure you're aware that the, the lights are on more than ever at, at the moment, and we like to operate on a 24-hour basis and basically um, deny our bodies the right to a circadian rhythm in many ways by uh, interfering with it with artificial light right up into the evening. And a 2017 study by the University of Exeter found that human illumination in the UK increases by about 2% a year, and globally, having the lights on can contribute to around 5% of global carbon emissions. And so I talk about this erosion of circadian rhythm, but when you're a bat and your entire survival relies on you being able to communicate in the dark and to be able to find and seek your prey successfully, this is not very good news, so we will turn to another reading um, to find out a little bit about why this is bad news. I should probably say that um, this talk will end on a hopeful note, <laughs> as, as most of the chapters try to. Um, so I try not to go down the, the doom and gloom, but also, to, you know, we can't sugarcoat the realities. It helps our understanding. Um, and also, what was a lovely part of doing this this whole book is uh, because I didn't know much about the species at all, and I wanted me and the readers to kind of learn together very much as as, as friends, I guess, along the way. Um, I supplemented my lack of knowledge with chatting to the leading experts and researchers all over the world who are actively studying and helping these species through um, through their work. And so, in this bit, I chat to an amazing PhD student called Jack who uh, studies at Southampton University and studies the electromagnetic uh, radiation impact on bats. And he had a very good way of explaining it. The impacts on bats is just massive, Jack admitted. The area around the lights create predictably clumped food sources, a kind of vacuum for midges and moths. We've all seen the frenzy with which the moth fraternises with the lamp. And this mass exodus of insects attracted to the city glow that Jack described leaves those bats left in the surrounding countryside caught in what some call an ecological trap. 
by slender invertebrate pickings are all that's on offer. Crossing a noisy, illuminated street for many bats is like asking us to walk through a brick wall. It just doesn't work with its biology, Jack remarked. Craig, another expert, agreed, stressing how light averse grey only bats are. Artificial light can delay or even prevent emergence from the roosts, or cause bats to abandon the roosts altogether. And that's bad news if you ain't real one that you. Research like Jack supports calls for bat bridges and safe bat paths, following similar logic to green bridges over motorways, which simply corridor wildlife. Tree lines, hedgerows, speed reductions, culverts, bat boxes, and containment of light spill are modest but promising thoughts to support the dwindling species of our landscape. Bring on the day that a road sign hailing bats are here is designed and normalised across cities. Um, so, has anyone got any questions on that? Yes. Um, what about telecommunications? Do they have any um, impact on bats? As in, um, like radio masks and mobile bus and things. Yes. Like that. yes. Um, that's a really good question. I can't answer that confidently, um, but I imagine it would have a similar effect to um, the electromagnetic radiation from lights and LEDs and things like that. But I will note that down mentally. <laughs> but thank you. Yes. Um. Are these grey only bats attracted to light or do they avoid it? I mean, some insects spend a lot of time flying around like holes and uh, get a big yeah. I'm just wondering if they can see it as a food source or if they're sort of scared to come out where they might be targeted by owls or something. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So the question was. Um, if uh, are bats attracted to lights because moths, for example, are attracted to lights and therefore they would then make themselves vulnerable to predation themselves by basically being conspicuous all of a sudden. Um, I think I remember asking uh, one of the researchers that question and I think he said that they pretty much try and avoid it as much as possible. And then so they almost end up being uh, threatened by lack of food they'd almost favour avoiding light um, in the name of going hungry than actually disrupting their uh, communication ability um, by going into the light. So it is worrying and it is a very, very real problem. And so with all of this and all these uh, pieces of information, I decided I wanted to try and go and see that itself. Uh, myself, even. And uh, does anyone recognise this view? <laughs> she farms here. Oh, <laughs> oh, just for you. Um, I'll be talking about that later. <laughs> yes, make sure you come to that time. I knew that. Um, so, uh, I decided that my low carbon mode of travel this time would be a lovely hearty hike on the South West Coast path. And I enlisted my friends, Brian and Harriet. Uh, for the ride, who um, I think were very enthusiastic at the start, and then 23 <laughs> kilometres in, uh, were looking at the bus timetable of how to get home. <laughs> but we did it, my mum very kindly dropped us off at Austin, and we hiked, I think it was 23 or 26k, to Axminster along a very uh, juicy section of South West Coast Park on a very hot July day. And um, it was really lovely for me to be able to have the room in the book to explore not just about the species and the climate and the implications of what all this means, but also to talk about family and friendship and how um, all of this relates to us and our daily lives. And so um, the extract I'm reading is very short, but it's just a nice little uh, breather from the sciencey bits um, to try and talk a little bit about uh, the walk and travel. So there's a lot of travel elements in here which I really enjoyed um, writing. And I start this having <coughs> been in lockdown along with everyone else for the first few weeks of summer 2020. So this was the first walk that I did uh, after we were allowed back outside. Oh, I have missed my girlfriends. The endless chatter. How often should we wash our hair? And do you face the shower head or away from it? Is going to bed at 9.30 p.m. now considered sad or sensible? We spent a good portion of the stretch between Sidmouth and Western Mouth riding on circular sentences of should they or shouldn't they, of does he like my 
with me in that way, though. Mm -hmm. And debating the ethics of the girl making the infamous first move. A bench that was dedicated to Brian, who loved this view, was gradually being reclaimed by the grass. Grasshoppers churred in the breeze. I felt like we were on holiday, falling into the trap of associating the exotic and interesting with foreign shores. Lush valleys and old weathered woodland folded into a cleavage between cliff tops. Everything had this hardy, steadfast exterior. Our quads endured a battering on the ascent of Western Cliff. From all directions, its steep climb is infamous. A summit so long and flat, it looks as though it's been locked with a cheese wire. The southwest coast path has an uncanny ability to test your emotions. One minute you stand empowered and elated, having just reached a peak. The next you slither down the ladder to the shore. This game repeats itself along the entire 630 miles. And it was at Western Mouth Beach that Harriet, Brian and I stripped down to our underwear and ran, drunk and looking stumble, squealing into a brown sea. Despite the cold brush making the sound like a full maternity ward in sure need of hot towels and a midwife, <laughs> it was bliss. Rinsed by the waves, the breeze stepped in for the blow dry. Salty, refreshed and proud, we dressed, scoffed sandwiches, and rejoined our path to the grey morning bat. <laughs> so, uh, my friends have deserted me at this point, um, <laughs> in need of a, a hot bath, and um, I turned up at this farm in Axminster, which is home to one of the remaining nine maternity roosts of this bat. So in the summer between April and October, the grey longing bat can sort of gather together in groups of up to 200 individuals um, and raise their young all together. And their favourite places are places like this lovely old barn with huge beams um, here where they can sort of nest and then uh, snuggle up in the evenings all together. And this is Neil, who took all of the stunning photographs that you've seen so far, hopefully you can see them with the sunshine um, in, these, in these slides. And another thing that's so, um, I find so captivating about this animal is that up until Neil took these photographs, no high resolution photograph existed of this bat in England at night time, simply because it's so elusive and so covert and nighttime photography in high resolution is difficult anyway, let alone a bat that basically wants to be completely invisible. Um, and so it was really exciting to see him at work and then a few weeks later to see the results um, of his really hard work. Um, oh, I can't even see that. Ah, so if you can see that, that's literally just a picture of the barn and then Craig. <laughs> <laughs> his barn, his Craig. Uh, and Craig has all his special bat detector, iPad technology, which basically basically need all the help we can get to try and see this bat. Um, and the, we were trying to get the mum bats who were leaving the barn ready for a nighttime foraging, so they can forage up to five kilometres away and leave their pups for up to six hours at a time. And one of the things that is concerning is that as the farmland and habitat and meadows around the area are getting increasingly fragmented. The lactating mums, who are essentially the breastfeeding, tired, a lot of energy expenditure going on, are having to travel further and work harder simply to find um, the same amount of food for their pups to bring back. So we were aiming to just get the bats leaving the barn, but that was a task in itself. And I'd never used a bat detector before, so it was all very new to me and very exciting. Really testing my patience as well. Um, so, the, oh, I think I have another extract I was going to read there actually, if that's okay. Um, does anyone have any, any questions? No? Great. Um, so, this, I think, extract is um, my first experience in waiting for a bat, and I am not very patient, so this is it. Through my receiver came a different call, like someone tapping a biro and patiently on the table, or water dripping very fast. Perhaps the Dorbenton's bat. I had twiddled my dial, impatience tiptoeing around, tempting me to settle for any bat at all. But none of them was a grey long -head. I dialed it lower, returning to 30 to 50 kilohertz. The white mollies are the lullaby. If a grey long bat appears and chooses to echolocate, then the noise we hear would be a faint purring. At 
apt for this particular bout of force to emulate feline superiority. Craig admitted it's rare to detect the return of bats. His admission suited my fading energy. I wasn't up for a six hour stint. I needed my bed, YouTube, and a bit of cheddar. So we orientated our detectives towards the black hole of the barn, waiting for those yet to embark. Now nearing 11 pm, it was utterly silent, save for the rustling of jackets and shifting of feet. All of a sudden, two, maybe three, black shapes darted over me. I strained for any purring over my detector, any at all. Nothing. Unsure, I grinned at the prey, trying to correspond through the thick of the dark, but I couldn't see him, nor him me. The night sky got grim instead. Our whispering hunter may have just left the building. Never know. <laughs> um, so, I say whispering hunter because this bat is also known as the whispering bat, which is very exciting. Um, and this is because essentially, where most bats echolocate no matter what, um, these bats can choose whether or not to echolocate, so they can turn on and off to basically be the most stealthy hunter they can, which is why they're so impossible to find, let alone photograph. This photo by Neil is an insect. I think this is a tympanic moth. I to say I was an expert. But let's go with, it, with a tympanic moth. Now, this moth is the favourite snack of the grey longhorn bat. And these animals have co evolved in tandem with each other for millennia. So they have evolved to adaptations that complement and challenge and complement and challenge each other's adaptations all the way through their lives on this planet. And so they're so in tune with each other that they almost can't live without each other. It's very interesting. Um, and so when most bats sonar, so they make some clicks that sound like a biro tapping, if you were listening to it on a receiver, would illuminate the surrounding area like a bright torch. So it'd be like when you're shining a torch like this. But with a grey long in that, their sonar is so weak for us um, and other insects listening out for it that it would be like a candle. So it's torchlight versus candlelight. And that's where they're so sort of invisible in the night sky. And um, it's more often the way, really, that the more specialised an animal, the more vulnerable they're going to be to change. And so this is why I was keen to look at this animal from a climate change point of view, because it's so utterly specialised with its hunting tactics um, that uh, it just makes it all more fragile, all more urgent to understand. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit, very briefly, about the evolution between the grey long bat and the tympanic moth. As I mentioned earlier, a favourite snack of the grey long bit is the yellow underwing moth, a regular resident of an English meadow. A tympanic moth, the yellow underwing has evolved its own set of skills to avoid being taken. The tympanic organ, a drum-like sensory hearing aid, has developed in response to the fear of being eaten ultrasonic hunter. Many moths have adapted in this way. Tympanic membranes can read a bat's sonar and sound the alarm bell, giving a moth the chance to evade capture. A group from the University of Bristol, including Dr. Goalitz, found that yellow underwing moths are tweaked so minutely to the sonar of bats that movement the size of an atom can activate the nerve cells in this hearing organ. But we've seen this before. From the gazelle slipping the grip of the lioness to bacteria outfoxing antibiotics, an invisible battle across nature strives for the upper hand. Nature's arms race. An impetus to become smarter, faster, stronger, more immune, yet as habitual and unnoticed as breathing. During our call, Orly, who was another expert, described how the whispering bats could switch off their echolocation to simply listen to prey generated sounds. The fatal betrayal of a wing beat and a rustle of antennae are sometimes all that is needed. The arms race between moth and bat has made the grey longhorn think beyond the standard issue acoustic box, making it covert, sly, and challenging to study. As primatologist Franz Fahl so rightly asked in the title of his best selling book, Are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? Well, Franz, I throw my hat into the, into the proverbial ring. Hazard a guess, but we are not. <coughs> so, um, back 
to pesticides, everyone's favourite subject. Um, why do we need this bat? Well, there's lots of research to show how bats are amazing natural pest control agents. They can fly around a meadow, they can basically hoover up a lot of, they can hoover up like 4,000 insects a night if they want to, and if they're able to, if they're available. And so they can, I mean, as a farmer, perhaps you might be able to enlighten me, but from what I understand, um, and speaking to the different experts, the grey longer bat can be an amazing form of natural pest control. So much so that uh, farmers in Germany, they've studied, have actually reduced their annual spend on human-made pesticides and actually spent more money on bat conservation, recognising that bats can do the job better and also just be indicators of a really healthy, functioning, um, dynamic ecosystem. And so we really need this bat to help do uh, good things to our land. But the trouble is, is that as soon as we apply pesticides, it locks the bats into this vicious cycle, as well, along with insects and other things. So we apply pesticides to the ground, we kill insects, fewer insects, we have fewer bats, which mean more unwanted insects because they're not being hoovered up by the bats necessarily, which then mean more pesticides are applied to the land. So there's a lot to do there, um, and it is a big research priority to increase understanding. Um, but one clear, if anything, economic reason to help bats in the countryside is for natural pest management. Now, there's a really interesting thread of thought uh, that I mentioned briefly in the book in terms of how climate change could, it's, it's so easy to assume climate change equals bad news. In many ways, yes, but in many ways it can actually be a blessing in disguise and open up new opportunities for species that didn't otherwise exist. So I mentioned that the stronghold for grey longing bats exists uh, further south in the Mediterranean, in the Iberian Peninsula. But as we know, post-2022 summer heat wave, everything's getting quite hot, and it's looking like it might do that uh, more regularly when the frequency of heat waves is on the rise. And so that really is bad news for uh, areas in Spain, which are already very hot. And so the theory is, is that the Iberian Peninsula very, may soon get way too hot and actually push the grey longing back up north, back to us, where our climate may become perhaps more Mediterranean and be a little bit more hospitable for grey longing bat. So it could be that one day, they predict 2018, I'd say sooner, depending on how our temperatures rise, um, may end up being more hospitable to the grey longing bat. But it would only work if our habitat is welcoming and hospitable for them. If we have those joined up margins, if we have wildflower meadows, if we have healthy insect populations to help support them and to stop that gene pool from uh, shrinking even more. So it's an interesting thought. Obviously, lots of work is needed there. Um, but I like the, the hope that that brings in terms of climate change. The reality that it is actually end up being a good thing in some cases. So what's next for uh, the grey long bat? Well, there's lots of good work being done. There's this very, very cool sounding project called Return of the True Night Rider, uh, which is being spearheaded by the Bat Conservation Trust. It's happening between Devon and Dawson, and its main aim is to connect those genetically <coughs> isolated populations between Devon and Dawson and other areas in the south of England, and to create corridors by working with landowners, working with communities, to help join their travel routes back up again and to prevent further genetic isolation and to help populations breed um, more uh, properly and not to have too much interbreeding going on. Another big project that's happening at the moment, which uh, really interests me personally, is just education around how we talk about bats, how can we talk about bats better and communicate their benefits and their services to society and overlook the fact that they host many pathogens, and remember that we as mammals and many other mammals also host many pathogens, but bats just get a little bit of a disproportionately bad rep for that. And so, uh, yes, there's lots of really cool things. There's some bat crossing signs that are in play in some areas, and uh, grey longing bat populations are on the rise, which is really cool. So they have been very, very vulnerable for the last, especially 10 years or so, but the Bat Conservation Trust, they've been such a flagship species for them, um, and so they've identified increasing numbers of these maternity roosts in churches and farms and 
uh, places all over Devon, which is really exciting. So long may that last. And um, there's one more reading, and then I think this is done. Has anyone got any questions about anything? You're talking about bat crossing, and a little bit I understand about bats is that they do have quite quite um, distinct, defined sort of routes between yes. feeding places and return to roosts and everything else. Um, do, do, do you know if insects have been mapped in the same way? So like you're, talk, you're talking about like insects moving towards light. Mm -hmm. um, is there a sort of like system or mechanism that any scientists use to sort of like identify populations of insects within say a, you know, a field or next to a road or next to whatever that indicates where the sort of like concentration of insects mm -hmm. might be and whether or not they correlate between? That's a very good question. So the question is, are there techniques that are being used by science to map the movements and hotspots of insect populations and to see whether they correlate with bat movements? Mm -hmm. like Again, I can't answer that confidently. Yeah. I know that um, obviously our insects are having a bit of a tough time at the moment, and so in terms of ramping up the effort and surveying insects around the country um, using all different kinds of survey techniques is definitely an increasing priority. But in terms of correlating that with bat movements, I can't say for sure whether that's happening, but that's a really interesting thing that I will go and find out. Does anyone, does anyone know? I know there are lots of natural history people in there. Are you going to make a corridor for the feather along the missing? And if that opens the lights, that particular environment, it lasts for reasons, and therefore it must have to uh, vegetation yeah. or the insects there between it. Yeah. You're not going to open a corridor where the bats don't like to go. Yeah. So you're creating, you, you must have to create an environment where the bats want to go. Yeah. And so uh, everything must tie in together. Yeah. I mean, as a general rule, it's not just a road, that's what I'm saying. No, it's no. An environment yes. Environment. Yes, exactly. And you know, generally, uh, in terms of where the insects are, other animals will follow it's along the water. So, in terms of creating these corridors which help animal movement in between cities and towns and villages and to help join up a very fragmented landscape, um, it has to be a dynamic functioning environment. It can't just be yes, it's a road, as you say. But I think, in terms of communications, they like to call them back bridges and back pathways to really help us visualise the rules a bit better. Um, thank you. Uh, ah, yes. So this is just a little bit about research priorities for that uh, at the moment. Um, the person who's speaking is this amazing researcher who's spearheaded most of the research on this back across the world, and she's based at the University of Exeter, which is called Dr. Orly Rasga, which is very cool. It's our impacts on the environment that are causing this risk, rather than being an intrinsic problem in bats. Because you see, it's all about how close we get to the bats themselves, how much we prod their habitats with our problems and test the boundaries. Knowing them is knowing our future. We could better predict how a disease might spread alongside land use change. We could better predict for and mitigate its inevitable spillover into humans, livestock, and other species. Knowing bats better could shift the baseline needed to future proof ourselves and the natural world. But it's easier to slag things off instead of finding a solution, isn't it? Um, so that's the final thing. And I'm leaving you with my favourite photo from that day. Um, and it's a uh, bat poo, but I'm not going to tell you what which bat it is. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting moment for me at circa five past midnight. Very tired. Um, and if you're curious as to what it is and why I'm so excited about it, um, you might just have to read the book, which is available. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you very much. That, that is uh, that's the end of the talk. But um, if you have any questions about the back or the book, or anything or nothing, then <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you.